Well, good evening, friends. My name is Joel Fraser with Kingdom Reformation Movement. I want to welcome you to a program this evening, The Upper Room. Indeed, we are looking forward to a tremendous time in the presence of Almighty God. Let's open up with a word of prayer. So, Father, once again, we thank you for this privileged opportunity that you have given us to share your word from this platform. We pray, Lord, that as your word goes forth today, it will go forth with power, with might, with accuracy. And Lord, we are careful to give you all the praise, all the glory, and all the honor that is due your matchless name. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Well, friends, we look forward to sharing this time with you. And the Lord has placed a word on my heart that I know will be a source of tremendous encouragement to you. And just about 34 years ago, musician Bobby McFerrin, pen one of the more popular songs of our time entitled don't worry be happy and the first verse goes like this he says here's a little song i wrote you might want to sing it note for note don't worry be happy in every life we have some trouble when you worry you make it double don't worry be happy. And while the song makes a good point of why we should not worry, it doesn't tell us how to stop worrying. And I know many of you would have, you know, experienced a warm, fuzzy feeling every time you hear that song. But unfortunately, that's all the song does. Because today, 34 years later, we're still plagued with the scourge of worry as no song in itself can produce worry-free living. Nevertheless, I have some good news for you this evening, especially for those who are, you know, chronic warriors. I have some good news for you because unlike Bobby McFerrin, Jesus went one step further and in our text today we'll see that he didn't only tell us why we should not worry but he also provided a prescription that if acted upon could cure the curse of worry once and for all. Jesus gives us very powerful words of wisdom on how we can experience sustainable worry-free living because the words of jesus they're not just words they're words that impart life and so i want you to turn with me in your bibles to matthew chapter 6 we are going to read from verse 25 to 34 let's digest these words from the master himself and these words came on the back end of Jesus' most famous sermon, the Sermon on the Mount. And I want you, as you hear these words, I want you to receive these words as coming directly from Jesus. I want you to imagine Jesus is on the other side of the screen speaking these words directly into your life. That is how I want you to imagine these words this evening. So it reads as follows. Therefore, I say to you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. For they neither sow nor reap, nor gather into bands. Yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? And which of you, by worrying, 
could add one cubit to his stature. So why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow, they neither uh, toil nor spin. And yet I say to you that even Solomon in all of his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Now if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore do not worry, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For after all these things the Gentiles seek, for your heavenly Father knows that you have need of all these things. God knows all of your needs. He knows your concerns. But Jesus said, But seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. And all these things that you need will be added to you. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow. For tomorrow will worry about its own things. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. And may the Lord bless the reading of his word to our hearing. And today, almost anywhere you go, you're sure to find someone who is worried about one thing or another. I mean, today people are worried about getting this coronavirus. Others are worried about the vaccine mandates and the implications of not taking the vaccine. Still, there are those who are worried about their health, worried about finances. Uh, some people are worried about rising food prices. Others are worried about job security or relationships. And I'm sure you could add to that list. In fact, many of you who are watching this broadcast, you may wor be worried about your own problems. And I believe that in the world today, we have more people worried about different things than at any other time in human history. We are living in a day or an age of chronic worrying. And so I'm not going to tell you, don't worry, be happy. Instead, what I want to say to you is don't worry, seek the kingdom. Don't worry, seek the kingdom. I believe if Jesus were physically on earth today, this is exactly what he would have said to us. Don't worry, seek the kingdom. And so that is what I want to talk to us about. Over the next few minutes, don't worry. Seek the kingdom because it's very important that we understand and contextualize this. Because while we wait and while we believe that the Lord is going to put in his appearance very soon, the question is, what do we do while we wait? Should we engage in all types of worrying and stressing out ourselves? The answer is no. The option is to seek the kingdom. Occupy ourselves with the kingdom of God. Why? Because this is how we will be able to persevere in the midst of the crisis, in the midst of the challenges, as opposed to worrying. And so this statement about don't worry, seek the kingdom, is not just some motivational or inspirational quote, quote. No, it's an imperative. It's a prescription to address the growing crisis of stress and worry that is affecting millions of people around the world. Because stress and worry, they are silent killers. In fact, the research shows us that stress and worry is linked to the top six causes of death worldwide, which include heart disease, cancer, and suicide. In fact, acute stress is the leading cause of sudden death, especially among young, 
healthy people who have no evidence of, men, of, of physical or medical conditions. Therefore, this need to stop worrying is no longer an option, but it has become a necessity. This leads me to the first point I want to make this evening, and it's this. Jesus' instruction to stop worrying is a command to obey and not an option to consider. Let me repeat that. Jesus' instruction to stop worrying is a command to obey and not an option to consider. Did you notice how many times in that short passage that Jesus said, don't worry? From the very first verse of the text, he says, do not worry. And Jesus is not giving us a suggestion, but instead he's giving us a command. He's given us an imperative to stop worrying. Why? Because he knows the dangers that are associated with worrying. And when we survey our world today, even within the local context, we see that people are worried about various things. But this crisis of worry that we are seeing today is not new because even during the time of Jesus, as we saw in the text, the people in that day and age, they were worried about many things as well. That's why Solomon said, there's nothing new under the sun. And some of the same problems that we are experiencing today, the people in the time of Jesus were confronted with many of the same issues. And so the words of Jesus spoken 2,000 years ago are just as relevant to us today as they were back then. And you would recall that in the time of Jesus, their economy was an agro-based one. In other words, it was based on, you know, people earning a living through farming, animal husbandry, uh, fishing, and other activities that we would consider to be menial or at the lower end of the social ladder. So obviously, these types of jobs did not bring in huge wages. And so the average Jew in that time and era did not have a large disposable income because the economy, as we said, was built around these uh, menial jobs. And coupled with that, you would also remember that the Jewish people were under Roman rule and the, the, the profession that was most vilified in that time was that of the tax collector because of the blatant corruption that the tax collectors uh, engaged themselves in. And they, what they did was they would have extort more money from the people than what was required so what we're seeing is that there's really nothing new under the sun these tax collectors were part of an organized corruption scheme and they would literally uh, raise the amount of the the value of the taxes required by the people and so because the people were overtaxed this effectively introduced a forced inflation on the people of that day that is why the tax collectors were so hated and vilified. They were considered to be the scum of the earth because what they were doing, they were exploiting the people who were already poor and struggling. And of course, because of this additional uh, uh, money that they had to pay, this forced inflation, it meant that the people had even less money to buy food and you know, drink and clothing and all of the necessities of life. And so faced with that predicament, the natural thing for them to do was to worry because they had a genuine concern of how they were going to make ends meet. That is why the people of that day, they had this great hope that the Messiah would come and deliver them and liberate them not just from the Roman rulers, but from this, you know, corrupt system that was exploiting them and extorting money from them 
you know, causing them to be poor, busted and disgusted. So that was the hope of every Jew. They desperately wanted an end to this system of corruption that, that literally put them in the economic slavery. And so every day their greatest source of worry was whether or not they had enough resources to make ends meet, to sustain their families. This was a real source of stress and worry in the mind of the average Jew. And so what we are seeing is that they were no different to us. You know, many times we have people, they are overburdened. You know, how are we going to make ends meet? How are they going to provide for their children? How are they going to pay the bills and so on? These were some of the same issues that the Jew living in the time of Jesus were faced with. And so within that context, it's easy to think that the natural human response, or it's easy for the natural human response to be, you know, one that is, you know, uh, uh, inclined to worry. That is the natural thing, because what else can you do? But listen to the words of Jesus. Jesus said, don't do it. In other words, Jesus is saying, you don't have to worry. You don't have to give in to that tendency and that natural inclination to worry. And that is why we see Jesus emphasizing that so many times in that text. He is saying, don't worry. Don't get caught in that trap. And Jesus was going in stark contrast to our natural tendencies. And so it might you might be saying, but Jesus... You're telling us don't worry. Aren't you being a bit unreasonable? I mean, these are legitimate cares and concerns that we have. You know, um, what are we to do if we don't if we if we if we don't worry about it? What can we do? And I suppose that would be a legitimate question. But why would Jesus, in light of that fact, tell us don't worry he does that because he knows that when you worry it does not add anything to your life worrying does not add anything to you in fact what worrying does it takes away it takes away a peace of mind it takes away your health it takes away your resources which you would have to redirect to buy medication and so on and so if we are not to worry, you may want to ask Jesus, well, Jesus, you're telling us not to worry. What then should I do? How am I supposed to, you know, figure out how to take care of my family? How am I going to climb out of this hole? That's a very legitimate and important question. It's a question that we are going to answer. But before we answer that question, as to what is the alternative to worrying, we need to understand the underlying causes of worry. And this takes me to my second point. Because Jesus doesn't only give us a command to obey, he also gives us the underlying causes of worry that we need to overcome. And as we will see in the text, there are three underlying causes to worry that we need to overcome. Three underlying causes to worry that we need to overcome. And Jesus wants us to be very clear. He wants us to have a clear understanding on what brings about worrying. Because only when you understand what causes worrying would you be able to overcome it. And the first thing that I want us to see that contributes to this, you know, thing called worrying, the first cause that we see in the text is a mixed up set sense of values. A mixed up sense of values. Listen to what Jesus said in verse 25 and 26 of our text. He says, therefore I say unto you, 
Do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink. Know about your body, what you will put on. And then he said, Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? And Jesus is asking us here a rhetorical question because the answer is obvious. I mean, people were worried about, you know, food and clothing. They were worried about things that had lesser value rather than con being concerned about the things that had greater value. And Jesus had to say to them, you worried about food, but isn't food of lesser value than your life? You worried about clothes, but isn't clothes of lesser value than your body? Why are you focusing your attention on things that have lesser value and not focusing on the things that has greater value? That is what Jesus was implying. And then he spins it another way. In verse 26, he makes the same point by giving us a different illustration. Listen to what he says. He says, look at the birds of the air. For they neither sow, nor reap, nor gather into bands. He says, look at these birds. They don't have a care in the world. They're singing. They're happy. Yet, your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? So Jesus is saying, look at these birds. They're not spending all of this time that you spend worrying about things that you can't change anyway. And yet, your heavenly Father takes care of them. Aren't you of more value than these birds? So Jesus is making the same point. You need to have the right sense of values because when you have a mixed up sense of values, when you have your values flip upside down it is going to cause you to worry but there's a second cause that contributes to worry and it's this when we have misplaced effort or misdirected energy it causes us to worry when we pour ourselves into things that lead to no results or limited results that is when worry comes on Listen to what Jesus said in verse 27. He says, Which of you, by worrying, could add one cubit to a stature? So worrying then is really a waste of time because when you worry, you don't change anything. In fact, the only thing that you succeed in doing by worrying is, by, is raising your blood pressure. You end up getting stressed out. You end up getting sick. You have to take tablets. You can't sleep. So what worrying actually does, it produces negative results. Yet, it's something that we can constantly engage in doing. Jesus is asking, why? Why are you stressing yourself over something that you can't change by worrying? It makes no sense. It adds no value misdirected energy or misplaced effort produces no benefit and so jesus is saying instead of pouring all of your time and attention and energy into worrying he says redirect it redirect it into something else something of word something of value redirect your effort and your energy it's very important to do that because there is coming a day, if it hasn't come for you as yet, when you are going to face certain situations and circumstances that will be beyond your control. Each of us are going to encounter situations like that where you'll have no answers. And so the natural inclination would be to worry. But Jesus is saying, if you worry about it, it makes no sense. It adds no value. It's not going to benefit you in any way. Because you can spend all of the time that you have worrying about a situation. 
and it's not going to do anything for that situation it's not going to improve the situation so jesus is saying instead of wasting your time redirect your effort redirect your energy and i want to say to you that you don't have to worry worrying is a choice that we make and in the same way that we make a choice to worry you can make a choice not to worry because worrying is not automatic as you may think you can retrain your mind to stop worrying because after all what is worrying have you ever considered what worrying is worrying occurs when you begin to think and ponder problems or fears that you can't change in your own strength it is the state of being anxious and trouble over actual or potential problems in fact most of the things that we worry about never come to pass most of the things that we worry about are actually fictitious they only exist in our minds so you don't have to worry you don't have to press that button called worry it is not automatic and you know, Abraham Maslow, the famous behavioral psychologist, he says human beings are motivated to achieve certain needs ranging from the basic physiological needs of food, water, and so on, to more complex needs such as self-esteem and self-actualization. And he postulated that whenever we have a perception that our fulfillment of these needs will be in jeopardy he says human beings tend to worry and so for example if you are faced with a financial situation a health situation or relational situation according to maslow your natural tendency is to worry about it to overthink it to the point where you become anxious and troubled because this is what worrying does but what I'm saying to you is that you don't have to give in to that urge or that ten tendency to worry about your circumstances. Because when you worry about things uh, in your mind and you overthink things in your mind, it does not add any benefit to you. You can retrain your mind. You can redirect your energy. You can redirect your effort. You don't have to, you know, you know, fall for that trap of, you know, overthinking your circumstances. But there is an escape. There is a way out. That's why the Apostle Paul says that you can take every thought captive and cast them down. Because that is the genesis of all worry. All worry begins in the mind. When you begin to think about things that you can't control, you begin to go through all of these mental gymnastics. But what does the Bible tell us? The Bible tells us, instead of worrying about your cares and your burdens, to cast them to Jesus, cast them upon Jesus. You don't have to fall prey to this tendency of worrying about things that you can't change. You can break the cycle starting today. All you have to do is redirect your thoughts. That's why Paul says in Philippians 4, he says, think upon those things which are lovely. Think upon those things which have a good report. Think about those things which are praiseworthy. About those things which have virtue. Those things which are noble. That's what we ought to be thinking about. Not about, uh, about you know, things that cause us to you know get stressed out no you have the ability to switch things up you have the ability to redirect your effort redirect your energy redirect your thoughts we have to rein in our thoughts and bring all of those thoughts captive to the knowledge of jesus christ that is how we can overcome worry the third cause that we see for worry in the text is missing faith yes so we have a mixed up set sense of value we have misdirected effort 
and we have missing faith. And I want you to hear what Jesus had to say about this issue of faith in the text. In verse 28 to 30, he says, Why do you worry about clothing? He says, Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. They neither uh, toil nor spin. And yet, I say to you that even Solomon, in all of his glory, was not arrayed like one of these. Now if God so close the grass of the field, which today is, and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you? And he ends by saying, Oh, you of little faith. So worrying is actually a manifestation of little faith. When you worry, it shows that you don't believe what God's word says. That's what worrying does. Worrying is a manifestation of little faith. Because when you worry, you place your confidence in your own scheme rather than trusting in God's ability to deliver you. Because that's what worrying is. Worrying is your, your attempt at trying to solve your problem mentally, which is futile. So really, worrying is a manifestation of little faith. And so, now that we've considered the causes, now that we understand what causes us to worry, we said we worry because of mixed up values. We worry because of misdirected energy. We worry because of missing faith. The burning question is, what can I do instead of worrying? What is the alternative? When I'm faced with issues of challenge and adversity, how do I stop myself from descending into this quagmire of worry and stress? What strategy can I employ to lift me out of this perpetual cycle of worry? And if that's your question, it's a very good question. And we have the solution to that question. Jesus gives us the solution. And it's this. He gives the cure that, that, that could stop worrying once and for all. Jesus gives us the cure that can stop worrying once and for all. And the first thing I want to say to you, friends, is that you can't stop worrying by trying to stop worrying. That's the, that's the exact reason why we fail. That's the reason why we continue to be harassed by our tendencies to worry. Why? Because worry originates from wrong thinking. And you don't change your thinking by trying to change your thinking. That's not how it works. Listen to what Jesus said in verse 33. He says, But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. What then is the antidote? What then is the alternative to worrying? Jesus is saying, Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all the things that you're worried about will be added to you. Now that's a loaded statement. Let's try to break it down so that we can see what Jesus was trying to tell us. And by this statement, Jesus is not denying the severity or our tendency to worry. Because in reality, we said that worrying and stress are silent killers. And no one knows that better than Jesus himself. But what Jesus is saying is that I have a powerful and potent alternative. Something that could supersede the effects of worry. And I want to give you an illustration. It's just like, you know, uh, the law of uptrust when compared to the law of gravity. And before Orville and Wilbur Wright made that discovery of the law of uptrust that enabled them to invent the aeroplane and cause the aeroplane to soar into the skies 
before that discovery was made, before they got that piece of knowledge, all modes of transportation was confined to the ground. But although all modes of transportation were confined to the ground, we would observe birds in flight. And so the question is, if birds could overcome the laws of gravity, why can't we human beings? And so that was the burning question for a long time. But only when Orville and Wilbur Wright stumbled upon this, the law of aerodynamics, the law of uptrust, and so by designing an object that was able to harness wind flow and the flow of air, they were able to tap in to the law of uptrust that enabled them to overcome the pull of gravity and cause airplanes, bodies that are, you know, much heavier than air to soar into the sky. What Jesus is saying, in the same way that you are able to tap in to the law of uptrust and overcome the effects of gravity, is the same way I have a law that enables you to tap in to the power of the kingdom to overcome the effects of worry. That's what Jesus is saying. So Jesus is saying, instead of spending all of your time and energy worrying, he's saying, redirect your effort. Redirect your energy towards the kingdom of God. And the key word there is seeking. I want you to think about that word for a minute. Jesus says to seek. And let us create a picture of what it means to seek. If you've lost something that is of great value to you, you are going to search for that thing until you find it. In fact, the greater the value is, is the wider the search is going to be. You're going to turn your house upside down. You're going to turn your vehicle upside down until you find that thing that is missing. Why? Because it's of great value. And so what Jesus is saying is that the kingdom is of such great value that we need to expend time and effort and energy seeking after the kingdom of God. Why? Because the kingdom of God has everything that you need. And Jesus gave us some powerful illustration of what it means to seek after the kingdom of God. And in Luke 15, he told us three parables about someone who made efforts to recover something that was lost. In the first parable, we saw the shepherd was willing to leave the 99 sheep in the sheep pen to scour the hills and the countryside to find that one lost sheep. Why? Because that one lost sheep had tremendous value to the shepherd. Next, Jesus described the woman who had lost a solitary coin. And to her, that coin was of such tremendous value that she was prepared to turn her whole house upside down until she found that coin. And then, of course, finally, he told the parable of the lost son. And although the father was willing to allow the son to take his wealth and go into a far country and spend it on riotous living. The father still held out hope that his son would return and every day he would go out to look and see if his son would return. And then one day after the son finally came to his senses, he says, I will return to my father's house and as he's making the long trek back who could he see in the distance waiting for him with arms open wide is the father of that prodigal son and so each of these uh, parables illustrates for us a picture of what the kingdom of God is like and what we are seeing here is that although the kingdom of God is at hand Although it's within your reach, it has to be sought. You have to expend time and energy to lay hold of the kingdom of God. In other words, 
access to the kingdom of God is not automatic. You must invest time and energy to lay hold of the kingdom of God. And Jesus gave us another parable. He says, you know, the kingdom of God is like searching for treasure. He says, when a man went into a field and he found this priceless treasure, he hid it back in the field and then he went and he sold all of his possessions because this treasure was so valuable to him. He decided that he's going to make it his life purpose to acquire the resources uh, to be able to buy that field he went and he bought that field and so the treasure became his that is what Jesus was saying you need to spend time and effort and energy seeking the kingdom because when you finally lay hold of the kingdom all of the things that you were seeking jesus says they're gonna seek you because the kingdom has everything that you need and so jesus is saying what you need to do is redirect your mental activity redirect your effort towards the kingdom invest your time and your energy in a limitless kingdom of of great value instead of engaging yourself with meaningless mental exercises of worry that does absolutely nothing and so when you are tempted to worry when you're faced with a situation i want you to think about the kingdom of god and all of its glory redirect re redirect your attention to the kingdom of god and that's why the Apostle Paul says, think on those things which are virtuous, those things which bring edification. Why? Because the Bible says, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. What we think upon is what we attract. That's the law of sowing and reaping. What you think upon is what you attract into your life. And so if you think about problems, if you think about challenges, if you think about difficulties, that is what you're going to attract into your life. But when you think about the solution, which is in the word of God, that is what you're going to attract into your life. You're going to attract, you know, the answers to all of the problems that you, that you need solutions to. And so we need to retrain our minds. We need to retrain ourselves to think upon the word of God but we have been talking about seeking the kingdom and the importance of seeking the kingdom we have said that we need to expend time and energy seeking the kingdom and many times we have heard it said seek first the kingdom of God but I want to ask this question where can we find the kingdom of God where is this kingdom located I mean, how do we, you know, make this practical in our daily lives? What does it look like to seek the kingdom? What does it look like to discover this kingdom that Jesus was talking about? How would we, you know, advise someone to seek the kingdom of God? What would we say to them? Well, what did Jesus say? Jesus, who was very masterful in using parables to convey, you know, profound truth. He told us about the parable of the sower and the soils. And he said, this sower went out to sow seed and the seed fell on different types of soils. But what is interesting is that although there were some soils that hindered growth and one soil that promoted growth, the one constant was the seed. The one constant was the seed. It was the seed that produced the harvest. It was the seed that produced the increase. Why? Because the life is in the seed. The power is within the seed. The capacity for transformation is in the seed. What is the seed that we're talking about? In Luke 8, 11, Jesus said that the seed is the word of God. 
That's why Jesus also said that my word, they are spirit and they are life. They impart life. So where does the kingdom of God exist? It exists in the seed. The word of God. That's where the kingdom of God is. It's in the word of God. The kingdom of God is hidden within the word of God. That's why Jesus says that the kingdom of God does not come with observation. It shall be within you. Why? Because the kingdom of God is wrapped up in the word of God. So where do we find the kingdom? We find the kingdom in the word of God. That is why the Bible tells us so many times to meditate on the word of God, to study the word of God, do whatever you can to get that word of God on the inside of you. Dwell on it, ponder it, mutter it, meditate it and rehearse it. That's why in the Old Testament, Moses told the people, he said, write it on your tables, put it on your forehead, put it on your wrist. Do whatever you can to get that word on the inside of you. Why? Because that word imparts life. That word produces after its kind. It is the seed that produces after its kind. But you know what the problem is with many believers? And this may sound controversial. But many believers read the Bible. But nowhere in the Bible would you see where God told us to read the Bible. We are not supposed to read the Bible. I read the newspapers. I read a comic book. I may read a novel. But when it comes to the B-I-B-L-E, the Bible is a different kind of book. It is not enough to read the Bible. You can't treat the Bible in such a trivial manner. No, you are required to study the Bible. You are required to meditate on the Bible. You have to ponder what you read over and over again. Rehearse it in your mind. Bring it up in your mind. In the same way that you would, you know, rehearse things in your mind when you're worrying about it. This is the approach we need to take with the Bible. We need to rehearse it in our mind. We need to replay it in our mind. And I'll give you an illustration of what this is like. This is what the cow does. When the cow feeds on the grass, the cow will chew and chew and chew that grass until it extracts all of the nutrients and then it will go down into one of the stomachs because the cow has more than one stomach and then later on it's going to regurgitate that stuff bring it back up and he's going to chew on it again and go through that process all over again and repeat that process until that grass is totally broken down why is the cow doing that so that the cow can extract all of the nutrients from that grass. This is how we have to treat the word of God. You can't just read it once. You have to meditate on it. You have to ponder it. You have to mutter it. You have to keep going it over in your mind. Allowing it to renew your mind. And renovate your mind. And change your thinking. You have to keep replaying. And rehearsing the word of God in your mind. This is how we have to treat the word of God. This is what Jesus meant when he said, Seek first the kingdom of God. We have to devote time and attention to seeking out the word of God. Why? Because there's life in the word of God. There's power in the word of God. And what I want to say to you is that as you begin to seek out the kingdom of God through the word of God, a special grace, a special favor will be released upon your life. A special anointing will be released upon your life such that all of the things that you were seeking out before will begin to seek you. Why? Because that is the power that is released when you begin to seek first 
the kingdom of God. And what Jesus is saying, he's saying, don't just seek the kingdom, but seek first. In other words, you have to prioritize this kingdom. Why? Because this kingdom is more valuable than anything else in this life. This kingdom has everything that you need. And so when you seek first the kingdom of God, everything that you need, is all inclusive is already provided why because the kingdom has everything that you need there's going to be a special release of supernatural favor that comes through the seeking of the word of god and the kingdom of god as you begin to meditate on the word of god and wrap your mind around the word of god that word will become flesh in you that word is going to release life. That word is going to produce after its kind. That word is going to release the supernatural in your life. The reason why we are not seeing the supernatural is because we are not seeking first the kingdom of God. It's because we are not spending enough time in the word of God. Because as you spend time an effort in the word of God. It unlocks the power of God to flow in your life. It unlocks the power of God to provide all of the things that you need. That is what we need to do. That is what Jesus is saying. Jesus is saying, when you tap into my word, it's the equivalent of tapping in to the law of uptrust. It's going to lift you up. That's why the Bible says, He's going to cause us to soar on wings like eagles. That is the power that is available to us in the word of God. And that is what we need to start doing. Seeking out the word of God. Meditating on the word of God. Until we extract all of the nutrients from it. And as you begin to do this friends. There's going to be a divine release. Power, such that the things that you are seeking out will begin to seek you. That's what Jesus said. He says, when you seek first the kingdom of God, all these things that you need shall be added unto you. That's such a powerful revelation. Jesus has given us the solution to end worry. That is the solution. We need, to, we need to place a greater level of importance on the word of God. Why not do that during the course of this new year? I mean, if you would just take one verse and rehearse that verse, meditate on that verse, think about that verse, how you could apply it to your life. There's going to be a release you're going to get so much revelation and insight. But not only that, that very word is going to produce after its kind. Why? Because the word is the seed. And when you rehearse the word, when you replay the word in your mind, it's like planting that word in your mind. And it's going to produce a harvest because the Bible says there's always going to be seed time and harvest. And whatsoever a man sows, that is what he's going to reap. As a man thinks in his heart, so is he. So when you begin to think on the word of God, it's going to produce after its kind. So that is what we need to do, friends. That is why we need to make it a priority to seek first the kingdom of God, to seek first to meditate on the word of God as you begin to do that, you're going to see a transformation take place in your life. You're going to see that the things that you were seeking out will begin to seek you, will begin to, you know, find themselves coming into your life. Because what we focus on is what we attract. When you focus on the word of God, that is what you're going to attract. Such a powerful revelation. That is what Jesus is telling us to do. And as you begin to do that, you'll begin to see 
some serious transformation take place in your life. That is what, that is the promise that Jesus is giving to us, friends. We can, you know, begin to see, you know, tremendous things happen in our lives if we will seek first the kingdom of God and all of his righteousness, all of the things, all of the cares, all of the needs that we have. They're going to begin to manifest themselves in and through our lives, friends. Amen. And as I conclude this evening, I want us to remember and I want to remind you that we are living in a day and an hour when there is this global threat of stress and worry. It's a global threat of, of stress and worry that is ever with us. I mean, there are so many things happening on the face of the earth in this complex world that we find ourselves. There's a myriad of problems, whether it's coronavirus, whether it's economic hardship, whether it's the scourge of crime. There's always going to be something that is going to, you know, cause us to worry. But what Jesus is saying is that we don't have to give in to that tendency to worry about things that we can't change through our mental gymnastics. And so this text today has given us a solution. It gives us a solution that emphasizes a command to obey, causes to understand, and a cure to apply. However, I know that when you are in the midst of the crisis, you may not remember all of this, but there's one thing I want to leave with you, and that is the word seek. When you're faced with your crisis, when you're tempted to worry, I want you to remember the word seek. Seek the kingdom. In other words, saturate your mind with the goodness of God and his kingdom. Saturate your mind with the word of God. Rein in those thoughts that will, you know, want to worry about problems and difficulties. Instead, bring those thoughts captive to the knowledge of Jesus Christ. In other words, seek out the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And instead of meditating on your problems, meditate on the God who can solve those problems. Meditate on the word of God. And when you do, exactly what Jesus said is going to come to pass. Those things that you were seeking will begin to seek you. Amen and amen. Well, friends, I trust that you were blessed. I trust that you were encouraged by the word of Almighty God to us today. I want to pray for those of you. You're facing a situation. You're facing a circumstance that you're worried about. It might be a situation related to your health. It might be a situation related to your children. Or your spouse it might be a situation related to your job but the common thread is that it's causing you to stress and worry Jesus says to you to stop worrying stop worrying about it don't worry about it you say well if I'm not to worry about it what can I do saturate your mind with the word of God Find out what the word of God has to say about your situation, whether it's a situation of lack, whether it's a situation that is taking away your peace. Find out what the word of God says. The Bible says that my God shall supply all our needs according to his riches and glory. Dwell on that. The Bible says God is able to give us peace that will pass all of our human understanding search the word of God seek out the kingdom by seeking the word of God find out what the word of God has to say about your situation and focus on that instead of worrying about your problems allow the word to come front and center in your heart and mind dwell on that spend your time immersing yourself 
in the word of God. Meditate on it. Rehearse it. Replay it in your mind. And as you begin to do that, you will begin to notice that you will feel differently. Why? Because the very word of God imparts life is life and help to your navel. That very word that you meditate on will impart life and strength and confidence into your experience. And as you begin to do that, eventually that thing that you were seeking will find you. It's going to appear. It's going to manifest in your life. Why? Because the word of God is the seed that produces after its kind. But you have to plant the seed in the soil of your mind. That is where the, 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 the battle is. You have to plant the seed in the soil of your mind. And when it's planted and watered, it's going to bring forth fruit. It's going to bring forth a harvest. It's going to show up in your life. So Father, I thank you for this profound revelation. I pray, Lord, that you will give us the courage. Give us, Lord, the awareness to catch ourselves when we uh, fall into stress and worry that we will redirect our thoughts. We think upon those things which are good, those things which are virtue, those things which are, are noble. We think upon your word. Let your word Find a new place of prominence in our hearts and minds. In the powerful name of Jesus Christ. Amen and amen. Well, friends, I know that the Lord is going to do something awesome in our hearts, in our lives. And I just want to challenge you to allow the word of God to bring about a transformation in your heart and life. Amen. And so friends, I want to encourage you until we see you again in our next broadcast. I want to challenge you to plant your feet on the ground. To look up because your redemption draw it nigh. And of course, always remember that the kingdom of God is at hand. So seek it out, friends. Amen. My name is Joel Fraser, the Kingdom Reformation Movement. Have a wonderful evening. And may God bless you richly. Amen. Amen.